Uh, our next speaker uh, will actually be preceded by a short video, uh, but we are honored to have Mike Peabody, a board member of Issue One, one of the leading national organizations whose logo you see behind me on the banner, that is working in Washington to coordinate the national reform movement and in particular to bring the voices of respected former members of Congress, former senators, former governors, and other national leaders from both parties into this debate. And so we have a short video with some of those national leaders, and then Mike Peabody from the Board of Issue One will speak. Mike will be followed by Brad Cook, speaking as a supporter of Governor John Kasich. We'll have a short video of Kasich as well, answering one of our questions in the field. And then we will turn to uh, the leader of the National Conservative Reform Organization, Take Back Our Republic, by the name of John Pudner. So that's the, the next three speakers. We hope that once again you'll, you'll come toward the front, take a seat, fill up your ice cream, and we will go right ahead with the uh, former members. This is the members of the Reformers Caucus of Issue One, and then Mike Peabody. Are we ready to go, Brian? Get that sound there, good. Do we have some volume there? Please join one of the leaders who's made this reformers movement possible, himself a former Republican candidate for Congress, a businessman, and a member of the board of Issue One, Mike Peabody. Thank you all. Um, so I am here to tell you about the history of this problem. I'm not sure, but I think I am the oldest person in this room. I'll be 88 next month. Anyone here older? No, I thought I was right. 225. Yes, but most of that's been in the grave, Mr. Madison. <laughs> um, that's the same age as Granny D when she walked across the United States to inspire us all to fight for campaign finance reform. Now, I'm not walking with the group because my back kills me when I do, but I'm just as disgusted as Granny D was at the corruption of money and politics that's imposed on our government. And I want to do what I can do so that my children and grandchildren live in a democracy as I did and not the oligarchy that's ruling us today. Indeed, my family has been here for 10 generations, starting in 1635, along with uh, Mr. Madison here. And five of those generations, they were citizens of, the, of free British colonies, and they were governed by their own consent in town meetings until 
1765 when, in a huge turnaround, George III imposed the Stamp Act on us to help pay for the French and Indian War. And if he had asked us nicely for financial help, we might well have agreed. Winning that war helped us a lot. But he imposed the tax without asking, and in one fell swoop, the consent of the governed was eliminated. And we had to fight a revolution to regain it. Joseph Peabody, my great-great-great-grandfather, served in that war. So here we are again, five generations later, and we've lost our consent to govern once more. And this time to money and politics, which dominates our congressmen, senators, and governors. But this time it didn't happen suddenly, as it did in 1763. It happened gradually. Oh, so gradually. Indeed, in, in the 70s, it, it started in the 70s and has taken us 40 to 50 years as campaign costs rose exponentially and to the point where candidates could no longer raise sufficient funds from inside their district and were forced to put their hands outside to get money from the lobbyists and special interests. Okay, I ran for Congress in 1968 as a Republican, okay? Some of you here may know my brother Endicott Peabody, Chubb Peabody, who uh, ran uh, against Warren Rudman as a Democrat. We split parties. The whole election cost me 75000 a sum I raised from, by small donations inside my district. And, but today the average to run a congressional campaign is $1.5 million and 10 million for the Senate, and some elections cost three to four times more. However, the increases were gradual. And over it, it happened over time, so the public was not aroused until, until the Citizens United decision in 2010, which defined money as free speech and unloosed millions and billions of dollars of soft money from corporations and rich ideologues into our elections. Most people now curse this decision and the Supreme Court that made it, but I believe it will eventually save us because it was a wake-up call. A wake-up call which is now stoking public anger to the point of action essential for reform. The man who was chiefly responsible for this decision was Chief Justice John Roberts. And two years ago, I was introduced to him at a party, and shortly after, found myself next to him in the lunch line. Mr. Justice, I wanted to congratulate you on the United, Citizens United decision. Oh, really, he said. Yes. It's ticked off so many people in this country, I think we'll really solve this problem. He didn't respond. <laughs> but the explosion of public anger since 2010 has persuaded me that I'm right. And indeed, I predict that years from now, we will characterize the Roberts decision as the Second Stamp Act. <laughs> that ignited we the people to the action needed to regain our consent. So how do we get there? Surveys reveal clearly that 85% are angry about this issue and want ch change. I think I'm right, everybody agrees here. Um, but hold up your, no, well, the, but the same surveys reveal that the same 85% feel hopeless we can solve the problem. Happily, they're wrong. There are laws that Congress can pass which go, would go far to fix this problem and which would survive the Supreme Court test, and we've heard a bunch of them this afternoon. But the bigger question is how can we get a Congress whose members are trapped by raising campaign funds from special interests to act against them? And the answer is, we the people have to unite <coughs> and force them. <coughs> and
And we the people can do this. We did it in the 60s to get the civil rights legislation, in the 70s to get equal rights for women, and lately with the gay rights movement. But we need to understand the problem clearly. So who can educate and ignite us to act? Issue one, on, which is this new group in Washington dedicated to this cause, we have a plan. We have learned that among those who hate the present system most are dozens and dozens of former members of Congress and governors. No one knows better than they how money politics has corrupted our government, and no one knows better how to fix it. And this past year, we have set up a, quote, reformers caucus, and you just saw some of that on the, on the uh, slide there, to en and to enlist such formers. And so far, 116 have joined. Now, I have asked that uh, we pass amongst you a list of those who have joined. Could you hold them up to see to it that indeed you have it? A, num a number do. Okay. So I'm not asking you to read every line right now, but do take it and study it, and you will see some really first-rate names. You'll note that four are from New Hampshire. Charlie Bass, Paul Hodes, Richard Sweat, Bill Zalief, Sadly, Senator Warren Rudman, who died three years ago, is not among them, for this was a cause that he fought hard for. You'll recognize the name of many prominent leaders, such as Senator Bradley, Bill Brock, who was just on the screen, Bill Cohen, Jack Danforth from Illinois, Tom Daschle, who was also on the screen, former governors Phil Hoff of Vermont, Tom Kane, and Christy Whitman of New Jersey. Now, take a look at your list there, and you'll see our website, issue1.org. Do you see it? Issue1.org. Click on that, and the video where six former leaders of Congress, of which you saw a bit here, share their horror about money and politics. Listen to Bill Brock admit that he'd rather be shot than turn over the present system to his 17 grandchildren. Listen to Senator Alan Simpson say with real emotion that the system is disgusting. That's the way he said it. Over the next few months, the caucus will be meeting to agree on strategy and content and expanding their force. And in the meantime, they will be speaking out where they can to help groups such as the New Hampshire Rebellion raise this to, and the public to action at the state level. So, where do we go from here? I am hopeful, if I can find my place. No, somebody stole mine. Oh, here it is. We can't predict at this time the specific steps that this group will decide upon. But it is my hope that over the next few months they will meet to create a document, one which clearly defines how our money politics problem from their own point of view and sets forth the solutions they know will restore the consent to govern and then sign it with their names and deliver it to our nation as the second declaration of independence. For as written in the first declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men 
deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And that wherever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. We need not abolish our government, but clearly we must alter it. And I ask each of you who wish to restore our nation's democracy to join the alteration process, which you can do by joining and supporting the New Hampshire Rebellion. Any questions? There's one back there. Uh, yes, are you approaching the uh, current Congress people to see if they will join your organization? Um, we are not. Uh, there are some who definitely would. But our whole concept is to create a strong bunch of former congressmen who are free to make their own decisions and to um, help ignite the public to force current congressmen to pass them. It's kind of an elder brother concept. That, uh, so at this juncture, we are not including current congressmen, many of whom indeed do support this. Question. As I, as I understand your question, um, are we at a point where we should redefine the president's position as one um, more of a, uh, a, a presiding person rather than a leading person? But that's what he was meant to be. He was meant to be a person who executes the laws of the land. Um, I believe you're right. Um, it's been different than that for many, many years. He's been an executive for many, many years. And I must admit that somebody has to have enough power to be able to convince the two houses to work together and get the, the, uh, the country put together and working well. Um, it, this is, means it has to be the president. I don't know, know of any other. So as it was set up in the Constitution, you are right. As it has worked out, it's been different. All right. Uh, any other questions? Oh. Uh, is this on? Hello. Uh, what are some of the strategies you were talking about using to roll this out? Well, again, um, I am not a member of the caucus. I helped to convene it, but they are going to make their own decisions. And so all I can say at this juncture is what I hope that we'll do. Um, but there are many things that they can do if they put their mind to it and, and agree together. But that's going to be a touchy point because they do come from 38 states or 39 states and from a wide range of, of uh, parties by that I mean some conservative some liberal on the other side so it's going to take a while to get them together and again we're going back to history the stamp act was passed in 1765 it was 11 years later before the country could come together 
and agree on the Declaration of Independence. We now have been six years since the Citizens United decision. It could well take us five more years before this group comes to the agreement and writes it down and all stand together. So I cannot tell you when that will happen, but I hope it's not five years from now. Yes, um, us too. Thank you so much. Um, big round of applause.